So 34. And finally, we get some gospel. Uh, we had a little bit last time, but I said it's going to start ramping up. Um, but there's always a backspin to gospel. I think we talked about that last week. So forgiveness of sins is good news to those who know themselves to be sinners, right? But if you don't know yourself to be a sinner, um, the first time you hear that, or the first few times, maybe the first hundred times you hear that you're a sinner, it's a little bit uncomfortable. Now, some of you probably grew up in the church. Most of you grew up in the church? Yeah, not really, no. So yeah, if you come to it later, I think it's like, this is weak. Like, I always grew up hearing, you're a poor, miserable sinner, and I was like, okay, you know? But, <laughs> but if you come and you're like, wait a minute, that's, you know, this is against God's word, this is against God's word, that was against God's word, and you're like, oh, right, and then, I think it's still, it, maybe is it still shocking for you a little bit? No? Okay. So. Well, here, here's the dirty little secret. Christians don't either. So, it, what's the big change? The big change is confession and absolution. Not, not your sinful flesh. It's, you still have that even after your baptism. And, um, the difference is that Christians don't know, uh, I think, quite as, um, quite as well. Um, actually, how nice life is with, without knowing your things that you do are sinful. <laughs> that sounds terrible, right? But it's like, you know, it's just like an animal, animal house, right? Fat, dumb, and stupid is no way to go through life, son. But if you don't know any better, it's... Seems great. <laughs> All right. Anyway. Uh, so we're going to talk about um, the shepherd and the sheep. So we're going to have to do some background before we... Uh, maybe we should read a little bit, and then we'll do some background. All right. So you get some context to get you going, some text. And then we'll talk about this whole motif of shepherd and sheep. Of course, you know about shepherd and sheep. You even see it every week when you're sitting in the pew, right? There's this shepherd up there, and he's got sheep. All right. So it's a pretty powerful image and an old one. Uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's read the first chunk. Uh, now let's just read one through six to get started. What's on the screen there? And the, and the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound out the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost, but with force and cruelty you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And they, be and they became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and on every hill and on every high hill. Mm -hmm. Yes, my flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth. And no one was seeking or seeking, seeking or searching. Or searching for them. <laughs> yeah, I know. Sorry about that. All right. Uh, so, now, of course, when you think of this, you're thinking, when you think of shepherds who are scattering or um, feeding on or whatever, you're thinking about what kind of shepherd? You're thinking of John 10 shepherd. Not, not the good shepherd, not the shepherd, the good one. Tain poem, poem, te to agatho. Yeah, in Greek. The shepherd, the good one, you're thinking the shepherd, the bad one, the hireling, right? who knows nothing for the sheep, cares nothing for the sheep. All right. Now, what's interesting about this picture, and I wrote some of this down for you, is, uh, yes, it's one of the most popular, familiar because of the Good Shepherd theme. The, uh, oh, well, let me do what's on here first, then we'll go where I was going. Psalm 23, of course, the Lord is my shepherd, all right? And then John 10 is, I am the Good Shepherd, which you hear every year. There's a connection between this theme and also Matthew 25, verse 32, which says, anybody know? No, not off the top of your head. You can't just recite it. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one, one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Remember the parable, the sheep and the goats? We just did it a couple days ago. Yeah, in our daily prayer. That's right. 
He will set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left, right? So this is what shepherds can do as well. All right, so that seems familiar. Um, the shepherd language also governs Luke 15, so we should probably look at that. And this will explain to you why it's so familiar. Woe to you, having a hundred sheep, or what man of you, I should say, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it. You heard this before, right? Yeah, we heard this earlier this summer. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. When he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. Which means the man seeking the sheep is a shepherd. shepherd. Right. I say to you, likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Not sure who those people are. <laughs> uh, but you see how that goes. How about Jude 12? When was the last time you read Jude? Yeah, it's short. There's no chapters, just verses. These are the spots in your love feast, agape feast, while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carried about by winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots. This is talking about, again, um, these false, false uh, prophets. So there you see, they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. So I think that's in the background as well. And then Revelation 7. Dun, 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 dun. We've talked about how uh, important Revelation is to, or excuse me, Ezekiel is to Revelation. Uh, 17, right? Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. Sorry for the screen. Eventually it'll catch up. <laughs> there we go. So he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. All right. There's a sheep. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. John rightly recognizes that um, the metaphor got blended in, Jesus, in the revelation of, of Jesus, right? Not only... Is he, the, is he the shepherd? The Lord has always been the shepherd of his people. But we find out that the Lord also becomes flesh and dwells among us, right? And is like us in every way except without sin. So he actually becomes the sheep in order to shepherd the sheep. I, this is why I like when Jesus talks. He, he makes his metaphors. It gets confusing. And you're like, okay, whatever you say. All right, yeah, transition. So he's, but he's the lamb. It's kind of like... Um, uh, what we all kind of long for is actually that, that we would elect people who are like us and not unlike us, not Richmond, North of Richmond, but actually <laughs> like people who are, you know, come from the same background, middle class, working class, white, white collar people, that there was a way that we could elect those people. That we could have elections that don't take mil hundreds of millions of dollars to elect or even that's even true in the state. Like to be a, gov to be a, uh, what was on the Supreme court? How much money did the, that, uh, what, what's her name? Janice Sa 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 Some Polish name, right? Protozewicz. That's it. It was like $140 million or something to be a, to be a state Supreme Court justice. That doesn't make sense. Doesn't make it. Mm, something here is not right. Yeah, that's what we would want. We actually want a lamb to be a... Sh we want somebody just like us who understands us in every way, who's not apart from us, but actually is to be out in front, Right. Uh, that's actually probably a good lesson of leadership, right? Is to not set yourself apart from people, but actually be, to be one of them. And uh, that's really true almost always for pastoral ministry, at least in our tradition, in our church body, that the pastor kind of gets the median salary of the people in the congregation. If you live in a wealthier neighborhood, the pastor gets paid better. If you live in a poor or a farm community or whatever, farm communities aren't poor. They think they're poor. They're, they're cash poor, but <laughs> right. Um, so, you know. That you want somebody who's of your people, and that Jesus epitomizes that to the highest degree. He's not, even though he's true God, he's just like us in every way, a true man. So John does that. So what kind of shepherd is that? Um, it is the traditional Old Testament text for Misericordia Domini, which you know the Latin name now, right? Of course you do. Some of you remember from TLH anyway. That's the second Sunday after Easter in the in our the lectionary that we use. So you hear the Ezekiel 34, the next part of Ezekiel 34, verse 11 through 16, you hear that every year. 
So that's why it's so familiar to you when we get to it. You'll be like, oh, I've heard this before. Um, if, you're, if you remember when the congregation used the three-year series, or if you follow other churches that do that online, um, it comes up twice in series, what did, I wrote it down for you. Uh, on the last Sunday of the church year in series A, it's the Old Testament text. And then on the 19th Sunday, proper 19, which is like the 17th Sunday after Pentecost, something like that, in series C, it comes up. So you hear it two out of the three years, but on different Sundays. All right. Now, here's the part I wanted to tell you before, but um, I got ahead, ahead of myself. The metaphor of a shepherd is widespread in the ancient Near East. So why is it so common amongst Christians? It's because it was common amongst everybody. Right? Which means then that Christians wisely used it predominantly because people could identify with it, even if they weren't coming you know, from a Jewish or Christian background. Uh, the picture of the gods as shepherds appears in the Sumerian or Mesopotamian and Egyptian literature. So the gods are pictured as shepherds. Um, I could show you some uh, hieroglyphs you know, where the, the gods have a shepherd's staff and they're leading people, but they're sheep. Um, in the... Where did I go? Oh, in Homer, you know Homer, Agamemnon, the leader of the Greeks against Troy, is called the shepherd of the people. So that's uh, both in the Iliad and the Odyssey. Yahweh himself is often called or described as Israel's shepherd. So there's Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, right? Uh, Isaiah 40, you probably know that one. Once you get into it, you'll recognize it. Comfort, comfort, yes, my people, right? Says your God, speak comfort to Jerusalem, cry out to her. Is that right? I might have written down the wrong. Oh, no. 40 verse 11, sorry. There it is. Behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand, and his arms shall rule for him. Behold, his, behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom, just like the picture in church. Yep. And gently lead those who are with young. All right? But that's that famous text that's quoted. We hear it. We hear this text on... The third Sunday in Advent, I think it's the third or second Sunday in Advent, with John the Baptist, right? Comfort, comfort, my people. You know that one. Yeah. Uh, Micah, we looked at that. That was the first Bible study we did when I came a long time ago. And we studied there. Uh, What verse is it? That toilet is incredible. I feel like it's going to take me in every time. <laughs> Shepherd your people with your staff, the flock of your heritage, who dwell solitarily in the woodland in the midst of Carmel. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead as in days of old. As in the days when you came out of the land of Egypt, I will show them wonders. Right? This is a big chapter to pro- prophetically speak of Jesus. Um, where is it? All right, I'm not going to find the more context for you. All right, and then Psalm 80. You know that one by heart. Now you will recognize it. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who dwell between the cherubim, shine forth. Before Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh, stir up your strength and come and save us. All right, give ear, O shepherd of Israel. So that's uh, a title for the one who sits on the mercy seat between the cherubim. Right? In the, in the holy place. Remember, when the temple curtain is torn in two, why is that? Because the one who sat on the holy seat is now crucified upon the cross. So who's the shepherd of Israel? Jesus. Yep. Good. Uh, and then you see this term shepherd, and the reason this is really important for what we're reading in the first part here, to answer your question, the question I asked, I should say, not your question, my question is that the verb to shepherd or shepherd often refers to Yahweh's appointed ruler. So Moses is called the shepherd in um, somewhere, Isaiah 63. David is, is called the shepherd of Israel in Psalm 78, 70 to 72. Even the pagan Persian king Cyrus is called a shepherd in Isaiah 44, 28. And then sometimes the biblical usage even expands more than the ancient world to include all the ruling class, the ones appointed by God. You'll see that in Zechariah chapters 10 and 11 and Jeremiah 23. All right, so um, you'll see this later on in the notes. Oh, no, we'll see it in next week's notes. um, Because I decided to split the chapter into two for us. Is that the people called shepherds 
you, it could be prophets, it can be priests, it can be kings, or Yahweh himself. So whoever he appoints to lead his people, whether spiritually, physically, or otherwise. Make sense? So it's not really as demeaning as maybe we like, like we're dumb sheep and, G- and Jesus is our shepherd because he's so smart or something. And, you know, and sheep are dumb. So who is it? Oh, my mom was telling me a story about somebody who has sheep and they said that sheep were dumb and somebody in the congregation wanted to like press charges against them and bring them on under church discipline because they called sheep dumb. I'm like, sheep aren't dumb animals. And you're like, yeah, well, actually, um, it's, most animals are dumb. Actually, I don't know. We have a dumb cat. Well, our cat actually smart. We have a little kitten. And she's smarter than the dog. Yeah. All right. So um, it just means to lead in another sense because that's what shepherds do, right? They sometimes lead from the back, you know, with the crook, you know, and pull you back and go that direction. Sometimes they, Jesus also speaks, the sheep hear my voice and they follow me, right? John 10. So the sheep follow and they hear the voice. That was true. Uh, we had to drop some stuff off at my, uh, my parents on the way back. My dad was out with the sheep and they were following him because it was time for, to be fed, right? I didn't even know his voice. They just know him. Like he's the guy that comes and feeds us, which is pretty cool. Right. So what a great picture of uh, who we are. Now, this is not, of course, the greatest picture because, oh, I, what happened? There we go. I was like, how did they get it all on the screen before? Because now we're talking about a different kind of shepherds. These are the predatory shepherds, right? This is the other kind of ruling class. A little question as to who these people are, because unlike we've seen with pre- previous oracles, there's no date and there's no context. So maybe it's some people um, between, oh, I don't know, let's guess, between the years of 597 and 586. (laughs) Remember, I asked last, I think it was last week or the week before, how many years from when Ezekiel started prophesying to when when the fall of Jerusalem was? Jerusalem fell in 586. He was taken into exile in 597. So... What is that? That's like 11 years. I said 12 years, but I was close. All right. Um, It's not primarily political. That would be my suggestion to you. If it were political, he might give us more political context. So we're talking not this worldly, not political. We're talking spiritually. Of course, Yahweh's big concern is is not just that you be freed from earthly tyranny, right? Although he does that, right? He takes the people out of Egypt or he'll take them out of Babylon, so it's true. He doesn't want you to live under tyrants because he wants to provide for your body and your life, right? We pray about that every day, daily bread. Um, but here, I think the shepherds that he's talking about, and he probably is the way that we usually understood this. So we're talking about spiritual shepherding, being free, set free from the captivity of our sin, right? Uh, enjoying the freedom of the good shepherd, the one who died for us. I think that's what's going on. And this is the real danger. And I don't know if you've been following this on, it's been kind of a big thing on the internet. Sometimes you'll hear it on cable news, but about Christian nationalism, you've heard about this? All right, so there's, there's a lot of uh, Christians even making the case that our country would be better off if we actually paid attention to what the Bible says about being a good and virtuous people. And of course, the press would say, well, that means you want to turn this country into a ostensibly Christian nation and then get rid of everybody who's not a Christian, either convert or leave, that kind of thing. That's what they're saying is true, even though the Christians who are arguing that there'd be, there should be a greater role for the, uh, what Jesus teaches in our, the governing affairs of our country, if we want to prosper and do well, they're not advocating to kick out everybody. They're not ar- arguing for like a lack of tolerance or something. But um, unfortunately, that, that's how these things get spun up. Because ultimately, you are the enemy. Because you're the ones who actually care about people. <laughs> and the people who don't care about people don't want you caring about people because then they lose their authority. Because they're the ones who are supposed to take care of people even though they don't. <laughs> All right. Um, but the problem is, is that Christians sometimes fall into this kind of triumphalism where we think, Esther, just leave her alone. Just go get a new one. Just go, uh, go get a new one. Let go of it and go get a new one. It doesn't matter which napkin you have. All right. Um, what was I saying? Oh, we fall into this temptation of thinking that to have, uh, to be a Christian nation, which arguably our country was predominantly Christian, not just the, the settlers, but uh, many of our states had Christian churches as their official state religion. 
which wasn't prohibited by the Constitution, despite what people have said, um, that it's not going to be widespread or true. And even calling yourself a Christian nation doesn't mean that people are actually going to live according to God's word. So there's that danger that you, that you think, even by you know, aspiring to such a thing, that it will make God pleased with you and he'll shower benefits on you and your country will go well. And maybe it will go better, but um, there's actually never a case, not even in God's word, not even God's own people, where they're faithful for very long. And we're, I mean, just read the book of Judges, read the book of the Kings. Um, they all, like I said in the sermon, I mean, David's reign is 40 years. The kingdom lasted 120 before it split. Or, yeah, before it split. And then the northern kingdom's gone almost immediately, and the southern kingdom barely makes it that long either. So just having the Lord as your God, even publicly as a nation, isn't going to actually save you. Um, what's actually necessary is faith, right? And this has to do with uh, not this worldly stuff. All right, so there's notes about that. Until the second coming of Christ, we will be plagued by evil shepherds of one sort or another, or antichrist, you might even say, to pick up John's language and the Revelation, right? Uh, whose chief concept of office as shepherd is to increase power, wealth, and status. I even joked about this. I had a pastor friend who, who's a, a senior pastor. He has a, you know associate pastor under him. And somebody wanted to interview him to be an associate pastor at another church. And he's like, that seems like a downgrade or something, right? Like, I'm already a senior pastor. Why would I go be an associate pastor? I'm like, yeah, that's right. You have to climb the corporate ladder. Whereas the, the right question is, where has the Lord called me to serve? And maybe, it's, maybe I was supervising others, and then I'll be under supervision. I mean, whatever. It's fine. Um, so the church isn't governed by those thoughts. Uh, that doesn't mean that we don't, in our sinful flesh, even as pastors, don't desire, I mean, I even said something in the sermon about this, desire that the church once be what it used to be, right? There's nothing wrong with asking the Lord to give us increase or growth, right? But at the same time, that's not, it's not on you, it's on him to do it. The only thing that's on you is to be faithful to what he's given you, right? And then he either gives the growth or not. So, uh, yeah, so that's the, there is always that temptation. So the proper application is to the church militant in a broad and visible sense. The severest judgment will be for church leaders who lead their flocks astray from the truth of God's word. Woe to you shepherds, right? You've heard that before? Who devour widows' houses or something? All right, what is it? John 7, verse 17. Sorry for the scroll. Ah, yes, here it is. Um, sanct they are, uh, go back a verse, verse 14. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because... They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. You sent them, sent me into the world. I also have sent them into the world, right? So don't lead people astray from the truth of God's word. That's the point. All right. Um, and then, of course, by truth of God's word, we have to be clear. And I, I don't think we're always terribly clear about this. Uh, and we've experienced this because, like when we do job interviews for the school, um, we ask, you know, are you a Christian? Do you go to church? But we don't ask them, what do you believe of Jesus? What do you think Jesus, you know, what has Jesus done for you? Right? Um, and, that, and the challenge there is that a lot of people will call themselves Christian, but they actually know nothing or they don't believe what the scripture says of Jesus. Or they don't believe in the things that he has promised. Like he has said, go and make disciples by baptizing them in my name and teaching them my word. Not all Christians actually believe that, right? Or administering the sacrament according to his command, right? They, they celebrate it maybe a few times a year, if, if at all. All right, so that's the, that's the real important question, is that question that Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? He asked Peter, right? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. So that's how you can distinguish between a shepherd, a good shepherd and a not good shepherd. Also, by the way, by an ostensibly Christian nation and one who actually follows Christ. Right? Because it's like, well, you know, we have, we follow the Ten Commandments. Well, that doesn't make you a Christian. Sorry. Because the Muslims do that and the Mormons do that and they don't actually believe or they don't have the same Jesus you do. Make sense? Yeah. 
But what, what does the state need? It doesn't need forgiveness of sins. It needs law. And actually, the law we have in common with what they call Judeo-Christian faith. It's not really faith. It's just law. We have that in common. We agree with the Jews on the law, for the most part. Not kosher laws, of course, but civil law. And we agree with the Muslims on that, too, which is interesting. All the Abrahamic faiths, as they say. But what's missing, what actually distinguishes those Abrahamic faiths is who is Jesus. All right. And that's how you can tell who a true shepherd is from a false shepherd. Uh, what does Paul say? I aim to know nothing amongst you but Christ and him crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and a rock of offense to the Gentiles. Yeah. All right, where were we? Uh, by the way, we should note here that these false shepherds, I, don't, I, I think we want to be generous with them, that they're not always doing it out of malice. They're not like evil people. I mean, they are, but they don't know themselves that way. They're not thinking like, oh, I'm going to lead people astray and they're not going to believe in Jesus anymore. Especially the ones who call themselves Christians. Right? It's done out of ignorance, negligence, not knowing God's word. Um, maybe it's spiritual abuse. Maybe they are predatory in that regard. Um, or they're just trying to alienate you from Jesus. But not intentionally. I mean, it's just the devil's workmanship, we would say. Not, not the spirits. All right, where were we? There's a lot of things we could say about this, but I think that's good so far. So let's read the next chunk. So first... Here's who you are, and then therefore, right? Uh, there we are, verse 7. Therefore, who wants to read? <coughs> therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, says the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey, and my flock became food for every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd. Nor did my shepherds search for my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock. Therefore, O shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand. I will cause them to cease feeding the sheep, and the shepherds shall feed themselves no more. For I will deliver my flock from their mouths, that they may no longer be sheep for them. Yeah. So, of course, your echoes then about, you know, that they're wolves in sheep's clothing, right? Mm -hmm. Who devour my flock. Yeah. I mean, what kind of, I mean, shepherds do, we do eat the sheep. That's kind of, I don't, I, you have to, I mean, you have to feed yourself. But th this is obviously a metaphor, metaphorical shepherd. This is lead, being the leader of God's people, right? Um, so notice the flock becomes a prey, not only to the shepherds, but also to every beast of the field. So there you hear echoes of first Peter, right? The devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, right? So you have the demonic host being the, the ones who are seeking to devour these sheep. Um, also notice that, that my shepherds, those are the ones he's appointed and it's his flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock and they didn't seek out search my flock right now I've, i hear all of this as a judgment against myself <laughs> which is hard not to hear because um well i mean it's not really fair because i've been gone for like a month basically <laughs> but but um but i you know i can't help but think this morning who didn't i see this morning and i need to give them a call and give them a call send them an email send them a text you know like the long list of people that i didn't get i didn't follow up with because i frankly i just wasn't here and when you're not here, you're not really thinking about it. That's part of it. Um, nor do you really, you know, you have to be attentive to your family. Otherwise, you can't really serve the congregation you've been given to do as well. So it's not really fair to bring that kind of judgment against my conscience, but it's there. Like, who have we missed? Who haven't we seen for a while? All those kind of things, right? Um, these guys, it's not even on their conscience. They just don't even care. It's not that they fail. It's that they, there's no repentance. There's no... There's, it's not pricked their conscience. As a matter of fact, they're just going to eat the sheep. So they'll just devour the congregation until there's none left, and they'll move on to another one and do that one too. And unfortunately, this is true. This still happens. There's people who are like this. Um, let's see. More. Third paragraph. The language of sheep without a shepherd is similar to Micaiah's description of Israel's army about to be routed. The evangelists use the same language for the lost on whom Christ has compassion. Right, so there's the feeding of the 4,000, 5,000. This is the 4,000. Oh, no, it's the 5,000, right? They were like, he had compassion on them for they were sh like sheep without 
a shepherd. How many loaves do you have? Da, da, da. You remember the story. The straying is not only physical, but moral as well. Ooh, so we should probably look at some of that. The literal meaning stray sheep merges with the metaphorical and theological application to the Israelites. All right. The image is readily applicable to modern church life. Right. You've probably thought of that. Erstwhile members may be scattered for any number of reasons. And Mike knows this, trying to make calls. There, how many excuses do you hear? I'm, you, have a, you have a pretty long list of possible excuses. And you, there's not even necessarily a good answer to a lot of them. It's like, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, some will be found by other faithful shepherds, right? So not every other congregation and their pastor, they're not necessarily sheep stealers. The people who go to their church may have one or more, actually even decent reasons for it. Maybe that congregation has more people like them. That's an easier congregation to be a part of, right? If there's, like if you're a family with children and there's other families with children, that's going to work out better for you because it probably offer things that you're looking for maybe, you know, opportunities for those children um, for catechesis or something. So I personally, that doesn't matter as much to me. I just want people around who, you know, come to church and... Like, we don't have to offer every program and service for everybody, but some people, that's a reason, All right? Um, what are some other reasons? Oh, maybe their family's there and not here, and they'd rather be, they need to be with their family, or they want to be with their family. Maybe it's just closer to where they live, and so they can be more regular or frequent in attendance, because they don't have the excuse of it takes 25 minutes to get to church. Of course, then you have the opposite, people who will go a distance and drive past other churches, because that's the church where they can hear the, God's word faithfully, Right? It may not be actually the fault of the pastors or the congregations they drive past. It's just, that's the guy who speaks to me. I understand how he talks. He talks, but he speaks the way I speak. He thinks the way I think, that kind of thing. All right. Um, but the problem is many wander aimlessly and fall prey to secular flattery or abandon the Christian faith entirely. And that's the thing that we have to lament. You know, like church shopping, it, it isn't always successful. It often leaves people without a church home. We had that with COVID. I think you can probably think of some examples. People are like, well, now's my chance. I'm going to think about, maybe we want to go to a different church. And then they don't go anywhere. So once you decouple from a congregation, um, unless it's like out of necessity, um, I, think, I think you're at higher risk of being picked off, in a sense, by a false shepherd, or by no shepherd, actually, by the false shepherd, the devil. And so that's why they're described here as predatory beasts of a way of themselves, just like they become a prey by the shepherds who devour them, just like the wild beasts of the field seek to devour them. In other words, they're like the devil, or they're doing his work, if you want to put it that way. This is a pretty hard judgment, isn't it? But notice, uh, the judgment is against them, but there's also still a hint of good news already. I, who's the subject? Lord God. I am against the shepherds. I will require my flock at their hand. I will cause them to cease feeding the sheep and the shepherds shall feed themselves no more. I will deliver my flock from their mouths. That's good news, right? That they may no longer be food for them. So again, we don't know the historic context. It could be the immediate context of all those terrible kings that ultimately made deals with the devil in a sense. And that's how they ended up in Babylon. Um, it could be the Pharisees and the scribes when they get back from you know, those, those groups rise up and they mislead God's people. And Jesus talks about that, right? They're the ones who are devouring widows' houses, as he says. It could be the false preachers of the church until Christ comes again. I mean, it could be all of those people, not just one or more of them. So I think that's the wisdom of what Ezekiel does here by the Holy Spirit. He doesn't really specify a time or a place, which makes it a lot easy for it, easier to be universally applied, which Jesus himself does in his own preaching, Matthew 25, John 10, etc. Follow? All right. So, some comfortable going to church in their pajamas, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, what we weren't good about talking about is that that wasn't going to church. You know, I mean, I think I did. I don't remember what I said anymore. It was a long time ago, but, um, you know, I think I was lamenting through the whole thing. Like, we, we should be in person. We should be in person. But um, it's hard to remember now. And we didn't do it that long. It was, what was it, five, six weeks, maybe? Yeah. Um, 
like, not that long. That was a long time, actually, to be, I mean, I missed a Sunday, and I'm like, I don't know if I want to go back again. Sorry. No. <laughs> right. Oh, I made that comment. I'm like, if I took a month off from church, I'm serious. I might, might be like, I'd be like the great, what's it called? The great resignation. These people just don't, didn't go back to work after COVID because they got the stimulus checks. Yeah, except now the problem is the, the savings rate two years ago, um, U.S. citizens had saved approximate $2.1 trillion in savings. And now it's down to, to $200 billion, right? Yeah, $200 billion. And it's, they're spending $100 million a month. So it won't take very long until all of that free money is gone. Quote, unquote, free. It was by design, yeah. Because, well, then, because it, yeah, because then the immigrants take the jobs. Um, who have like a 10-year work visa, basically, because they don't have a court date for 10 years. And then you're like, you're like I want to work now. And they're like, hey, sorry, we, we got these guys now. We trained them up. Yeah. So... About the same age as her. I think she was born in the Yeah. And um, she lived in Sheboygan or Kohler all her married life. Yeah. But she was a member here from birth. You know, she, okay. She kept coming to Sherman Center Church all her yeah. whole Yeah. Yeah. Why not? And she had a public church in Sheboygan. Sure. Yeah. But that's that's my point. I mean, I want to kind of say, you go to the church that's close to you. Yeah. But, but like I said, I think. On my own experience, even like going to college, you know, when you get decoupled from your congregation because you can't go, to establish a new one is not easy. Um, the same thing happens with the day school, right? Like, once you pick a school for your kids, you don't want to take them out of that because you know every time it's traumatic for them and for you to kind of reestablish and figure out what's going on. So people are very careful about where they establish themselves, where you move, where you go to church, where you where you work, even. Because, you know, you don't want to transition into new jobs all the time. It's not pleasant. Yeah. All right. Uh, but how do we get to that? Oh, pajama time. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, pajama time. Uh, and it wasn't church. Why? Because you weren't gathered with, I mean, you were virtually gathered, but virtual just means it wasn't virtuous. So I don't know why we use the vir- word virtue. It's the wrong word. Um, electronically, I, I just called it fake. It was fake worship. It was a facsimile. It was like facsimile there. It's like worship, but not, not, right? You heard God's word, and we don't want to discount that. But we have the admonition of the scriptures not to forsake the gathering together in bodily uh, of some. And yeah, the resolution about this at convention, right? Don could share it with you, talking about in-person worship and encouraging that again. All right, that's enough on that. So we need, we need a good shepherd. We need God to be our shepherd. So let's read that. Uh, two chunks here. Let's read the first chunk, verse 11 to 15. For thus says 16. the Lord God, Indeed, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep, so will I seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, in the valleys and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in good pasture, and their fold shall be on the high mountains of Israel. There they shall lie down in a good fold and feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek what was lost and bring back what was driven away. Find out the broken and strengthen what was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong and feed them in judgment. All right, good for there. We'll hold up there. Uh, yeah, 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 I hear you. All right, I must have drawn on this. I drew on the screen. Uh, so again, this, this is the Old Testament reading for the second Sunday after Easter. But there's an echo of something that had just happened a few weeks previous. So it, not only is it drawing your attention to the theme of the day where you have the feeding of the 5,000 on that day, it's a Sunday of refreshment, but you're also drawing your attention backwards to what happened on another mountain on a day of a cloudy and dark day. What day was that? What's that? Well, yeah, it could refer to Moses, but in between, I like that. 
Transfiguration. Cloudy and dark? Yeah. Uh, that was bright. Yeah. We're getting closer. Clouds and darkness. Yeah, Calvary, crucifixion. Right, so uh, that's, that's when, this is what's really, what's really amazing about this. I will seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered. When does he do that? On a cloudy and dark day. So we're, how does Jesus gather his scattered wayward sheep to him? By dying for them. Yeah. Now, of course, I don't know if Ezekiel saw that. He had to say, what's well, a cloudy and dark day? And of course, you could understand the referent as meaning they were scattered because it was cloudy and dark. Uh, and that was certainly true as well, right? Who was with Jesus at the cross? Who stayed? Just John and some of the women, right? But at a distance, all the other disciples fled. So you have it both ways, right? Yeah. Um, so he's amongst his scattered sheep and he seeks them out and delivers them, brings them out from all the peoples, gather them from the countries. Oh, from the peoples. So we already have hints then as well as the bringing in of the Gentiles, not just, not just the Jews. Gathering them from the, from the countries, not just one country. It's not just the Christian nation or the Jewish nation, but all the countries. Bring them into their own land, which is the church, and feed them on the mountains of Israel. Again, another picture of the church in the valleys and all the inhabited places of the country. So that, of course, is very evocative, where Jesus says he sees them as sheep without a shepherd and he feeds them bread and fish miraculously. And you're like, wait a minute, that's a, that sounds like a, what Ezekiel said would happen. They're on, they're on the mountain and he feeds them, right? Of course, it could draw your attention to the Sermon on the Mount as well, where he feeds them not fish and not just their bellies, but he feeds them with, with his word. That's right, yeah, bread from heaven. So you have that as well. Um, and then, of course, they lie down in the good fold. He maketh them to... Yeah, yeah, you hear that? By the way, you also have Psalm 23 on that day. So that's why it's one of the best... There, there are disadvantages, advantages to every lectionary, but with the one year, with the, having all those Good Shepherd themes on one Sunday, right on the second Sunday after Easter, is really helpful, I think. Anyway, I'll feed my flock and make them lie down. So we have that. And then, of course, then we have the 99 sheep, right? I seek what was lost and bring back what was driven away. We also have all the healing being prophesied, right? Binding up the broken and strengthening what was sick, like the deaf mute man today. But I will destroy the fat and strong and feed them in judgment. So the fat and strong, how they get to be fat and strong? By devouring other sheep. Yeah, exactly. Right. And they will be destroyed on the day of judgment. So this is, in judgment, is probably a hard word to hear. Because we hear judgment always in a negative sense, right? Like you don't want to go before the judge. And especially if you're in a corrupt political environment where the courts have been corrupted as well. <laughs> you don't want to get indicted like the poor pastor. Not so poor. He made a mistake. He shouldn't have knocked on Ruby Freeman's door. But Missouri Senate, retired Missouri Senate pastor was part of the indictments in Georgia. And he wore his collar to his mugshot. So <laughs> it's kind of fun. Uh, apparently he's got a little bit of a attitude and not, not necessarily the friendliest guy, but still um, to go before a judge in judgment is, is always intimidating, right? Unless you already know the verdict, right? Uh, or if you know the, or if you know the verdict is going to be judgment because of what you've done, I suppose that's terrifying as well. But if you're not even sure, like it seems like a lot of these court cases, I mean, even if you're innocent, you're like, you don't know. It could go either way. It depends on the jury and the judge. They're so politically motivated. Do you know why they're so politically motivated, by the way? I mean, obviously, we talked about elections being a political thing now. Lots of money thrown at those judges to get elected. They, they select the juries. Not, they're, they're random, but they're algorithmically controlled in many jurisdictions. So you can actually kind of stack the jury against somebody if you want, and they do. They use jury selection devices to... And that's always part of like jury selection, right? Because you have both sides, defense and prosecution. And they're trying to, but if you stack it so that you just like, the defense just has to pick the worst evil. So just don't get caught in court. That's the answer. All right. But here, um, yes, Jesus has that two-sided judgment. That's the point, right? He judges the fat and the strong. 
um, for their iniquity, basically, for devouring the sheep. But he's also judging you, not guilty, for the forgiveness of sins, right? So you have both at the same time. Did I write anything else about this, Tom? Mm-hmm. Nope, good. Uh, let's see, verse 13. Three things there. I will bring them out from my peoples and gather them from the countries. I'll bring them in their own land, point one. Point two, I will feed them on the mountains of Israel and the valleys. Oh, that's point three. Point two, gathering, bringing them out and gathering them. Point two, bringing them into their own land and three, feeding them. So you have that. Now that should sound familiar to you. Called, gathered, enlightened, sanctified, the whole Christian church on earth, as we say in the explanation of the third article. Or if you prefer the creed, I believe in one holy Christian or Catholic and apostolic church. Right? So we have the church, the people, gathering them, bringing their own land, the communion of saints, that's the communion of the holy people and the holy things, and then feeding them also the communion of saints. That's his turn. I'll hold you. Ah, all right. So the mountains of Israel are the favorite site where the once leaderless are gathered together and fed and given um, to lie down together. So this is a picture of the Holy Christian Church is my suggestion to you. Does it sound like it to you too? He brought you together. He's fed you with his gifts. He's enlightened and sanctified you in the true faith on his holy mountain. Um, one of the things I thought, I thought about architecturally that might be nice to do someday is to bring the altar rail down so that people don't have to climb up the stairs. But there's a negative to that because by going up to the altar, you have the Psalms that talk about we'll go up to the altar of God. Plus, it's like going up on the mountain by having to climb those stairs as awkward as it is. Sorry. <laughs> if you can't do it anymore, you can't do it, right? Um, but we're trying to confess things by even our bodily motion and activity, like bowing and kneeling and uh, all those sorts of things. Oh, yeah? Mm-hmm. The rail down? Yeah, I'm sure I wasn't the first person. Yeah. And then it's like, well, the only person who gets to go up to the altar is the pastor, which is kind of like, nah, that's not really the point. It's actually everybody that gets to go up on the mountain. So we don't want to... What we do, like physically, can confess what we believe. And it can also mislead, too. And you get the wrong impression. Pastor's up in the pulpit because he's the most important person here. I'm like, no, it's just so you can see me and hear me. But, okay, fine. <laughs> All right, don't, I'm not going to drop you. You don't have to grab everything. All right, that was that point. And then, um, then we should look at the last bit. 17 to 22. Dun, 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 dun. All right, there we go. And as for you, O my flock, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I shall judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and goats. Is it too little for you to have eaten up the good pasture, that you must tread down with your feet the residue of your pasture, and to have drunk of your pure waters, that you must follow the residue with your feet? And as for my flock, they eat what you have trampled with your feet, and they drink what you have followed with your feet. Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, Behold, I myself will judge between the fat and the lean sheep, because you have pushed with side and shoulder, butted all the weak ones with your horns, and scattered them abroad. Therefore, I will save my flock, and they shall no longer be a prey. And I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will establish one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them. My servant David, my servant David, he mm-hmm. shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them, I, the Lord, have spoken. All right, hold up there. Yeah, we're not, that last bit we're going to save till next week, because uh, 22, 23, 20, actually 23 and 24, we'll probably spend most of the Bible study on next week, because there's so much there. Um, but we want to look at this first part, and I suggest to you, I, it'd be nice to know what he's talking about. <laughs> But we're not exactly sure. This belongs back to the first part, right, with the predatory shepherds, the false shepherds. But this whole bit about, like, defiling the land and the waters with their feet, don't really know. Do you know what what he's talking about? (laughs) Yeah, it's mud and manure. That's true. I mean, that's clearly what's going on here. Yeah. Um, Whatever kind of metaphor it is, I couldn't find another reference. I don't really have any terribly good ideas about it. But there seems to be some kind of conflicts um, between certain people within the flock, right? Between sheep and sheep. There's some kind of conflict going on. And uh, rams and goats, maybe. They're, 
they're like getting each other. They're, there's people within the congregation that are disturbing and disrupting the, the land and the water with their own behavior. Now, the feet part, the only thing I can think of, I didn't put it down, you know, is you have the promise of, um, of the how blessed are the feet that bring the good news, right? Uh, and that's also in Isaiah connected to the mountains as well, Pro- proclaiming the good news to the poor, right? To the binding up the brokenhearted. So the feet are supposed to bring good news. Jesus washes the disciples' feet, which is their like mini ordination of a sort, setting them apart to serve um, in the church by preaching the gospel. But um, if that's true, if that's kind of the background, then here these people's feet are not preaching the good news, but a word that defiles. That's defiling both the, the, the grazing land and also the water, which are both the good giving we would say those are God's word as well, living water, bread from heaven, that they're defiling that by their, by their own words, by false words. So maybe it's another way of talking about false prophecy, right? There are those who speak the truth, and then there are those who are corrupting the truth um, through lies. And again, maybe not, maybe not um, through malice, not intentionally, just they're like, you know, let me quote from the, you know, Bodhisattva, or let me quote from, you know, from the Buddha or something. It's like, see how that's just like what the Bible says. And you're like, not exactly. <laughs> yeah, false words, or even just Christian sounding words, but that aren't true necessarily. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't have a lot of suggestion as to what's going on here, except for um, not only is the Lord preserving the flock from those who would seek to eat and devour the flock, but also those even within the flock who are causing disruption and disorder and, and tearing apart the flock from within. Maybe that's what's going on. Does that make sense? Okay. Maybe between the repentant and unrepentant. We know that there are some faithful, but there's plenty unfaithful. Patrick and Dorothy, cut it out. Thank you. All right. So there's always going to be conflict in the church. We don't like to hear this, but I, I have to mention it. Um, because cause the center, uh, the congregation is... Well, it's a bunch of sinners, and the pastor is the worst of them. So, um, so the, these sorts of conflicts happen. The problem that we often uh, fall into is that we don't seek the resolution the way the Lord resolves things. How does he resolve conflict in marriage and family and congregation? By calling to repentance, confessing one's sins, and being forgiven. Um, and that's so contrary to the way that we under, op, operate things. I mean, even parents, children know this. Um, just say you're sorry, and then I forgive you. But how about say this, I forgive you in the name of Jesus, or for the sake of Jesus' death, I forgive you, which is a lot stronger. And, but even then, um, uh, it's just so uncommon. And I've been kind of harping on it, um, not so much in, in the church, but definitely in the school context, that this should be the center of the way that we deal, deal with conflict within, between students, between teacher and students, is that we actually seek to confess our sins and be absolved. And they're like, well, but we need psychology and other things. Well, those can be helpful and useful, but that's, we're a Christian school, meaning we follow, uh, we, we're here actually to receive the gifts that Jesus gives. And um, yeah, so uh, because it's so hmm, foreign to our way of operating, you know, we think we need to like deal with people's emotions and their social settings and, and well, those are all helpful things, but that's not the chief gift that we have to resolve um, conflict within the congregation. Oh, I wrote that down. Look at that. Um, actually, St. Paul describes the party spirit, the divisive spirit as a work of the flesh in Galatians 5. And so uh, we have to take seriously the reality that... Um, and that not all Christians believe this, so this is part of the reason why not all Christians practice confession and absolution with one another, or between the pastor, or between co-workers, is because we, a lot of Christians don't actually believe that they're sinners anymore. What? Yeah. They read Romans 6, describing the life of daily repentance and the forgiveness of sins as something that happened in the past. But now that I've been forgiven, now that I've been baptized or I've chosen to follow Jesus, or however they, whatever language they use, there's no more need for forgiveness. And you're like, I know you all think this is like, this is crazy. But talk to your evangelical friends, and you'll find this is often true. 
And that's the reason why then confession and absolution seems so weird. You know, if you don't come from that tradition of hearing that, um, that reality is a daily ongoing thing. The daily we die and rise with Christ in baptism, confession and absolution. Then you won't actually practice that daily. That's kind of a rant, mini rant. Um, but we have the gifts. That's the, that's the real point. Is God, God has not abandoned us, not forsaken us, not left us to our own devices. I've saved you, you know, and now go figure it out. No, it's, no, I'm going to be with you, and I'm going to shepherd you daily with the gifts that I get. My word, my sacrament is there for you daily um, so that you don't depart from it again. And so it does seem to maybe these, these sheep are, have lost sight of that, and there's some, or maybe there's some sheep that are no longer, that don't confess their sins, that don't want to be rescued, don't want to follow a savior, you know. And, uh, or, then of course there's the other danger, it's not really mentioned here, but maybe they're following the wrong kind of savior or messiah or shepherd, right? That's leading them not into faithfulness with Jesus, but actually away from Jesus. You know, like hope and change, or let's make America great again, you know, the, the kind of political messiahs that you don't really need even if you want a better place to live. They're not your Messiah. You actually want God to save you. No, anyway. So we'll get to that. And David is kind of the epitome, and that that we'll have to talk about next time, because David ends up being more than just a king, if you remember the story of David. So he's a great example of that. The last sentence is really important, and I'm just going to read it, and then we'll leave you with that. Um, the righteousness of God and his activity of judging are revealed not only in his condemnation of the sins of unbelievers, but in his justification of believers in Christ through faith alone. All right. So when we hear that word, he judges, where was that? That was back in verse 16. He will feed them in judgment. The technical word for that, that we use in the church is justifies. All right. So when we talk about justification, we're talking about his judgment of sinners not guilty for the sake of Christ and those who re- refuse Christ then um, judge guilty for the sake of their sins. And you can read about that in Luther's works for all 25 and go borrow it. It's over in the, in the stairwell. Or the Apology, Article 4, or Form of the Concord, Epitome, Article 6, or Solid Declaration, Article 3. There's lots of places where you can hear this kind of language. But uh, Augsburg Confession, Article 4, is on how God judges his people not guilty for the sake of Christ. And that's a good judgment. That's a great judgment. And that's the kind of shepherd you want. You don't want a shepherd who just just goes wherever you want. But you want the shepherd who says, that's not good for you. This is good for you. Come here. Go, Go here where there's clear water, green pastures, right? Safety, protection, right? Which is in his church. So again, David will be the epitome of that, but you'll have to wait till next time for that. Any, any uh, questions so far? All right, that was a lot to cover, actually. I didn't know we'd, I thought, you know. Next week we'll have a little bit briefer um, Bible study anyway because of uh, voters' assembly. Just have to prove contracts. So you got your, kind of got your two weeks notice. Today was week one. Next week will be week two. And then you stay for church. All right. Adios, auf Wiedersehen, tschüss, guten Tag.